Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us for Hotel Insurance Primary Umbrella and Beyond. My name is Richie Venner, and I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer at Distinguished Programs, responsible for developing and leading the marketing initiatives across Distinguished. I joined Distinguished in 2019, and I can't say I've enjoyed working any place more. Uh, prior to Distinguished, I spent over 25 years in executive marketing positions at GE Capital and York Risk Services Group, and uh, Distinguished beats them all. Uh, just a note, uh, we'll be sending all the registrants a copy of the slides, the webinar recording, and the PDF with the questions and answers from today's session. If anyone has any questions during the session, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to it uh, time permitting. I'm just going to wait here for a second for the slides to catch up with us. There we go. Uh, before we get going, uh, just a little bit about Distinguished Programs. We're a leading national insurance program manager, providing specialized insurance programs for real estate, community associations, hotels, and restaurants. Uh, serving the same core markets and partnering with the most stable and reputable carriers, Distinguished Programs High Limit Umbrella and Primary Insurance Programs remain the clear choice in its areas of specialty for superior coverage, competitive pricing, and attentive service. Uh, we've got a great panel for the webinar today. Uh, joining us are Sean Young, who is the Managing Vice President Hospitality Program at Distinguished Programs. Uh, as I said, Sean is the Hospitality Umbrella Program Manager overseeing the Express and High Limit Hotel Umbrella Programs at Distinguished. Sean came to Distinguished with the National Specialty Underwriters, some of you know it as NSU, acquisition in 2012, and recently celebrated his 20th anniversary with the company. He joined NSU as a CSR and moved to underwriting in 2007. Prior to joining Distinguished, Sean worked at Accordia Seattle on the retail side. Also with us today is Heather Jorgensen, Senior Underwriter, Hospitality Primary Program at Distinguished Programs. Heather is the senior underwriter of the Distinguished Hotel Primary Program. Heather brings over 12 years of underwriting experience to Distinguished. Prior to joining us in August 2021, she came from an underwriting background in both admitted and excess and surplus lines. Currently, she assumes the primary responsibility of property underwriting, along with involvement in general liability and auto underwriting. Uh, before we get to the attendee questions, and we had quite a few sent in ahead of time, uh, let's quickly run through some of our hotel program basics to ground the discussion. Sean, can you take us through some of the umbrella program highlights? Sure. So we have um, three different hospitality umbrella products that are available. And so those serve almost every segment of the hospitality industry for um, uh, for, for umbrella coverage. We have a program that that uh, covers your select service type hotels, your limited service. Uh, we have another product that covers your mid-scale and kind of your upscale. Then we have another product that covers your upscale, boutique, resorts, casinos, and even your city clubs. So we cover, we cover the gamut of the hospitality industry. We have a separate program for our, our restaurants. Um, that's, that's not really part of today's discussion, but it's worth a note because restaurant does fall under the world of hospitality. Um, we have robust coverage that covers your full liability needs, not a lot of limitations in our policies. We even have coverage for Legionella, as long as there's coverage underneath of us. And that's something that's super important for a hotel to have that coverage in place. We have um, great service with over 30 underwriters that have a combined hundreds of, of years of experience underwriting this particular type of business. So we can meet the needs of your hotel clients and um, we can help you to come in front of your hospitality clients uh, really as a professional with, with us helping you in the background uh, with all of the hospitality knowledge that we have. And then we offer very high limit coverage that uh, really should help your uh, customers to be able to sleep at night. Wow, Sean, that, that's very impressive. It's it's quite the program. I can see why it's market leading. Uh, Heather, what are some of the program highlights for primary? Well, Richie, for primary, we have world-class experts, dedicated claims team. We offer broad coverages. Um, 
Our key coverages for general liability are one mil, two mil limits for GL and liquor liability. We have broad form named insurance coverage form. We have crisis response. For the property, uh, we offer spoilage cover, pollutant cleanup and removal, ordinance or law, A, B, and C, outdoor trees and shrubs and plants. There are many more that we offer and we really do offer a great solution for um, hotels with our package policies. Wow, so all right, so between primary and umbrella, it sounds like we've got very comprehensive coverage for hotels. <laughs> Uh, but I, I know a question that we get a lot is, what are some of the risk classes we consider? What type of properties will we look at? Uh, Heather, what, what do we cover on the primary? For the primary, we like to consider mid-scale business class, boutique hotels, and resorts. Okay, a any difference or the same things for Umbrella, Sean? Yeah, the umbrella, because we have several products, it's just a little bit broader. So we serve everything from select service all the way up through the resorts and the casinos. Um, we, we can even do standalone casinos that aren't connected to a hotel, and then we can do city clubs as well. We can do timeshares, condo hotels, pretty much anything that falls within the scope of a hotel offering. Okay. I, I, Sean, for the umbrella program, I, I know one of the primary selling points is, is high limits. What do we tell clients, you know, why do they need high limits for their hotel umbrella insurance? The truth is this, a lot of hotels feel like what they need is just what their franchise requires them to have. And and, and we like to point out that that's really a misnomer. The franchises um, put forward a limit that they say is a minimal limit, and a minimal limit is just that, it's minimal. And, um, and, and it really is there to protect the franchisee or the franchisor more so than the franchisee. So we really, we, we know that um, with our almost 30 years of experience running these these products that those minimal limits just really aren't enough. And what we find is that it's really some of the most innocuous exposures that lead to the most catastrophic claims. So we've seen very large claims in the uh, areas of elevators, of autos, and then just slip and falls. When the wrong person slips and falls in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it happens to be in your hotel, it can be very catastrophic. And sometimes it's an eggshell case, sometimes it's just an elderly person, and they fall in just the wrong way. And um, it, so it can be everything from um, bathtubs and showers, toilets. These are the places that we've seen the largest claims come from. It's not necessarily large claims coming out of you know big unusual exposures so really we believe that every hotel should carry uh, pretty robust limits um, even even your limited service hotels really should have um, you know a, a limit that's that's sufficient to cover something very catastrophic that could happen in in a bathroom or uh, lots of lots of um, hotels have swimming pools uh, most hotels have some level of auto exposure, and and those are the places that we we find the claims creeping in. Um, sometimes we also see claims coming out of third party activities. That's really um, the area that's a little bit the hardest to control because your hotel isn't directly affecting the limit that's placed by a third party. So it's really important that a hotel has good contracts in place with all of the third parties that they do business with or vendors that come on site or anywhere that they're uh, directing guests because when a claim happens at one of those exposures, the claim does come back to the hotel. So um, it, 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 it's really the areas that you don't think of being large claim um, contributors that, that lead to the largest claims. Okay, all right, interesting. Thank you, Sean. I, I've got a related yeah. question. I'm gonna come back to it in a minute. I'm gonna to go to Heather for a second. Heather, could you give us uh, some of the primary hotel insurance benefits? Sure. We offer a total line of coverage solution for hotels with many added coverages with higher specific limits that uh, hotel industries need. So. While a competitor's quote may have the same coverages, we will have higher limits on our quote enhancement forms. Ah, okay, all right, thank you, Heather. All right, so Sean, here's my related question. And we're not at the questions that broker sent in yet, but we get this question all the time. You talked about the importance of high limits. How do, how do you sell high limits? It, 
it, it can be tricky, especially when a franchise leads somebody to believe that all they need is 15 or 20 million of limit. But, uh, and unfortunately, sometimes it comes down to fear tactics. And it, it's not a tactic, it's just a fact, really, that people need to understand the worst case scenario. That's what an umbrella is intended to cover, is the worst case. And of course, you hope that that never happens to you. And of course, you look at your you know, five or 10 years of experience and you say, well, we've never had a loss that big, but you hope never to have a loss that big. And if you do have a loss that big without the coverage in place, then you won't be around the next year to have the discussion. So um, it, it, it's unfortunately telling the truth about what can happen and what has happened. And I can tell you that every single hotel that has had a 50 or $75 million loss they thought it would never happen to them either. Yeah, they, okay, that, that's, uh, wow. I, yeah, a lot of things can happen that are unexpected. It's, uh, yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's uh, let's dive into the questions from attendees that sent in questions via email, and then we'll go live to today's attendee questions. So the first one is just, what are the common underwriting questions that you, that you get all the time? Uh, why don't we start with uh, with Heather on primary? What are the common underwriting questions? Well, there are many common underwriting questions. We can split it between property and the GL. First on the GL, uh, three very common questions are, is the hotel 100% sprinklered? We also need to know if the risk has a written contingency plan to move guests in the event of an emergency or a natural disaster, say a hurricane or an earthquake or the power goes out. Um, and then we like to see for the primary, uh, what kind of amenities the hotel has. And we need to know whether they're a first or third party. And depending on those answers, we may have additional underwriting questions. For the auto, uh, we like to see a description of use for each vehicle. And then we also need to see a driver's list with driver's license numbers and addresses. Great. And Sean, how about from your end on the umbrella? It's a lot of the same things for us on the, at least on the casualty side of that. Uh, the autos, auto is certainly a, a significant exposure for us in the umbrella world. And so, it's important for us to understand what autos are being used for and what their capacity is. It makes a pretty big difference if you have five people in a, a van versus 20 people in a van as to what the exposure is there for an umbrella. Really for an umbrella, what you're looking for are the exposures that could bring a catastrophic loss, right? Because we're putting up a lot of limit and, uh, and have a lot of limit exposed. So uh, it, it's also things like, um, uh, event space, anywhere that you're bringing large groups of people together, those are of a special concern. And so we want to look pretty closely at those to make sure that there's good security around those and um, and, and that they're well protected so that we know what, what kinds of events are happening and then how well protected the guests at those events are. And, and um, then it's, as I mentioned earlier, it's the third party activities. So really understanding uh, what, what's shown on the website, what's, uh, what kind of packages does the hotel offer? And so what third party activities are being drawn into our exposure by virtue of the fact that they're connecting vicariously to our um, hotel's operations? Okay, all right, great. Hey, and will you write all classes of hotels? Heather, let's start with you. We prefer mid-scale, luxury, boutique, and resorts. Okay. And how about for the umbrella, Sean? Yeah, so we, we write most, but really the very low-end economy class hotels are not an appetite for us. Um, but other than that, we handle everything up through casinos, even where there's no hotel rooms attached to the casino. Ah, okay. And uh, can you write in all states? Heather? For the property, the primary property, we can write in all states except for California, New York, Washington, uh, Texas, Hawaii, and the District of Columbia. For the GL, uh, the only restriction we have is anything that's on the shore in Hawaii. Okay, all right. So just to make sure I got that right. So you, for primary, you can write, 
everywhere except for California, New York, Washington, Texas, Hawaii, Florida, and DC. And the GL, yes. the only restriction is beach in Hawaii. That's correct. Okay. And then Sean, how about for the umbrella? Well, we certainly have appetite more so in some states than in others, but we can write in all states for our umbrella products. We can even write to foreign locations as long as they are owned domestically. So they tie back to one of the states with the domestic uh, domicile address, mailing address. And there, as long as they're covered on a DIC policy that bridges back to the US, we can cover foreign as well. Uh, but yes, we don't have any restrictions on any states for writing. Okay, all right. And if you see me glancing off, I'm looking at the questions that are coming in. And actually what's good is the questions that are coming in live, a lot of them match the things were emailed ahead of time. I, one of the ones that was emailed in is, will you write large resorts? And how do you underwrite them if you have both first and third party amenities? And Heather? We can write large resorts. Uh, we like to see if they have COIs from third party amenities. Okay. That was quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we can certainly write large resorts. We write some of the very largest resorts and some of the very largest casinos in the country, and we can certainly do that. Uh, there are activities uh, that are sometimes offered at resorts where we would want more than a one million limit underneath of us, and we have some carriers that we work with to help provide buffers when those are necessary. Um, but we can also just work with an insured to make sure that their third party vendors are carrying more than a million dollars. So motorized water sports, you know, if you have a resort where they're doing parasailing and they're renting out jet skis and some of those kinds of activities, um, you know, we don't we don't feel comfortable at a one million attachment point. But these are all things that we can work through and um, and we we are able to find solutions for almost every uh, type of exposure and every um, type of uh, of a hotels, including resorts, yes, for sure. Okay, all right, great, thank you. All right, so the next question, and th this is a tough one because I know we wanna spend the right amount of time on each submission to make sure that we uh, take a look at it properly and make the right decision, and the decision that's right for the broker and for the customer, but how quickly can you turn around a submission, Heather? Ideally, we like 30 days so that we can thoroughly underwrite a submission, but we do understand that there are sometimes short fuses on account, oh. so we can turn things around within two weeks, typically, if needed. Okay, all right, thank you. Hey, Sean, how about for the umbrella? Boy, it's a hard question to answer because yeah. there's what I want to put out there as what we need, and then there's what we have done in the past to help a broker out, right? I mean, we've turned something around in minutes and hours when we really can pull together a submission quickly and the, the stars align and everything works together. So we're willing to work with people when they come to us with an emergency and something that they need help with. But when we're really trying to work an account and, and we're looking at the ideal solution, we'd really like two weeks to turn something around. Oftentimes accounts, especially more complicated accounts, require a referral to one or more of our carriers. And so that slows us down just a little bit. If something is you know, a, a quick and easy turnaround, we ask for a week on that. But of course, brokers don't always necessarily know what's an easy turnaround and what might require referral. So it's safest to say that we'd like to ask for two weeks at least to turn something around. Okay, all right, thank you. I, and this next question is actually a related question. What documentation or information is often missing that slows things down? Heather, how about on the primary? Well, for the primary property, we require a completed business income worksheet. So when we don't have that immediately in the first um, set of emails with the submission, that can slow things down. Not having full building COPE information and proper building values will also slow things down. Um, Currently valued loss runs, we need to see those, a completed DP supplemental app. Those are all things that we really need upfront in the submission to help things speed up. Okay, great. Hey, and how about on the umbrella, Sean? What, what tends to slow those down? Well, we need the same basic submission documents that Heather just described for the casualty part of it. Um, 
the thing that I would say slows us down the most on Umbrella is when we don't get loss runs. And uh, for some reason, that sometimes seems to be a bit of a struggle to get five years of loss runs. Um, it, it, it's a, an expectation that's not unique to us. So, um, you know, I, I know that if people are struggling to get that for us, they're struggling to get it everywhere else. But um, that that's the one thing that can really slow down a submission because we can't really get very far in our process or our referral without that. Um, we sometimes also need to go back and, and seek more information about the third party exposures that we've been talking about. That's something that usually doesn't come with the original submission and we have to work through getting all of that information. And then of course an umbrella, one of the reasons that umbrella comes down to the very last minute sometimes and we are sort of the redheaded stepchild is that we have to have the underlying quotes before we can finalize our pricing. And of course, if the underlying quotes are delayed and come down to the last minute, it pushes up to us up to the last minute. And so unfortunately we get pinned as the people who, you know, cause everything to be last minute and it's unfortunate. We, we really like to work out as early as we can we get as far as we can and then kind of come up against a stop of waiting for the underlying quote to finalize. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Yeah. The next question, I think you've already answered this, but it was submitted by a number of people. So I'm just going to do it again for emphasis. Uh, how far in advance do I need to submit? Heather? Ideally, uh... 30 days, but we can try and turn things quickly around uh, depending on whether it needs a carrier referral or not. And Sean? Yeah, I, I, the same answer. Like, um, it kind of depends why you're asking this question, right? <laughs> like, if you have an account that that is your account and you control that account, you should submit it as early as possible because then we can help you to really work through all of the kinks and we can get you the very best possible coverage and the very best possible price. And sometimes if we're really racing up to the last minute on something because it came in your door at the last minute, I mean, we could certainly do that and help you, but sometimes it means that we don't have all of the questions answered that we would really need to to put out, you know, expose $170 million of limits. So we might come to you with a quote that has some limitations on it, or, um, it, you know, it, would, it wouldn't necessarily be the ideal quote as it would have been if we had worked early and really worked through all of the kinks. So okay. two weeks, please. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sean. All right, this one's for, for yeah. Heather. Um, why do I need to submit the package if you already write the umbrella? Well, an umbrella doesn't go over the property coverage, so mm -hmm. we need a full submission. And we're also first dollar versus the umbrella that is not first dollar, so we may have more underwriting questions. So we need a full submission with a primary package. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. It, it, so, it, it's surprising, oh, Richie. Gosh. We sorry no, go ahead. while while the GL and the umbrella are covering in essence the same exposures for the most part. Um, they're looked at somewhat differently just because the primary, like she said, it is first dollar. So you're really concerned about those those nickel and dime claims that are that are you know picking away at your at your aggregate. And for the umbrella, we're exposing a lot of limit, but we're a little bit more re more removed from the original losses. So we do look at things slightly differently, but very often the ideal accounts are true for both of us. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sean. Sure. All right. So, so I'm going to take a couple of questions from our attendees today, but if uh, people can just bear with us, we're running a little bit short on time, and so we're not going to get to all of the attendee questions now. But we will be mailing everyone who's attended a PDF with the questions and answers from today's session, and we'll also take a look through the stuff that was sent in and uh, put some of the answers to that also in, in what we send out. Uh, so, the, the first question that I see here uh, is, can you work with tribal clients? Uh, I, I know that's not always a straightforward answer, but uh... it, well, it, it is a little bit of a straightforward answer. Uh, we're contractually required not to within the programs that I write. We work only with tribal first. So outside of working with tribal first, we are unable to look at tribal accounts. Okay. Uh, does your primary GL program offer uh, 
2 million, 4 million limits to qualify for your umbrella. At this time, we can only do 1 million, 2 million limits. Okay, but that still qualifies for our umbrella. Is that correct, Sean? Generally, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, I think we've got time for just one more. Let me, uh, they're just being fed into me from our person who's monitoring this for me. Uh, what hotels are considered mid scale? Any examples? Heather, sure. do you want to I can answer jump that. Jump on that one first. Sure. Okay, right. go ahead. Uh, I would say uh, your residency in Marriotts, the Hilton Garden Inns, those type of hotels yep. are going to be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say it's limited service or select service if it really doesn't have much of a restaurant or any restaurant. So once it has a little bit of a restaurant and some liquor exposure, it starts creeping into mid scale. And then it's going to be full service if it has like larger conference space and that kind of thing. All right, great. Thank you, guys. So I defined it by defining the things around it. How about that? All right, so we're almost out of time, but before we conclude, let me ask our panelists, what's the final piece of advice you'd like to give to the audience? Sean? Final piece of advice? I, I mean, we are anxious to work with you. We're anxious to uh, write hotels we we write the largest proportion of hotels for umbrella of any program in the country and we would love to bring our expertise to you we are excited that we have more to offer than just a great product i mean that's a good thing to have a great product but we also have some great expertise and some wonderful people that love to work with you and partner with you and so if you bring to the table what's the story what are we trying to accomplish we're able to work with you to try to accomplish that and so we want to be more than just transactional we really like to be a partner with our clients that's great heather anything to add to that i think sean said that very well we really do want to build a relationship with you and we hope that by working with you on one submission it leads to another and we can build a level of trust where you know that you're going to get a good solid quote um, and have something that you can bind coverage with for your insured thank you heather all right uh, if you enjoyed today's webinar stay up to date on our latest events by following us on social media we post about the insurance market insights and industry news uh, every week, and you'll learn about our latest free webinars, ebooks, and case studies. I'd like to thank everyone who joined us for today's webinar, and thank you to our panelists, Sean Young and Heather Jorgensen. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you for your time, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks Bye. so much. Thank you. Dun, dun, dun. I believe we are out, if not high audience. <laughs>